This podcast will talk you through the ups and downs in the entertainment industry. Each and every one of you has a talent, but it's a tough business. People gonna tell you, get a real job. By introducing you to sustainable, moldable methods in a crazy, cutthroat world. Let us harness our willpower and take real action. Don't let it get you down. Join me, brothers and sisters, on a journey through trials and tribulations. Unfake it till you make it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Unfake It Till You Make It podcast. I'm Tony Seriano. And on this podcast, I have conversations with various people who make a living in the entertainment industry, all while trying to keep a good head on their shoulders without going too insane. Previous episodes include YouTube star and film teacher Ryan Connolly, film and TV composer Jake Staley, executive producer in top Hollywood films Richard Barada, and an actress who has recently had reoccurring roles in YouTube series Cobra Kai, Annalisa Cochran, just to name a few. Today's episode is another special one because it is with an intuitive entrepreneur and magician I've wanted to interview for quite some time, Asad Chaudhry, who I've learned quite a lot of serious magic techniques from over the years, not only teaches professional magic, but has created an online platform or hub, if you will, for magicians all around the world at 52cards.com with a K. He's produced magic products like luxury playing cards for the magician and even a specialized one of a kind magician's wallet. His recent Kickstarter campaign, Mint 2, has become one of the most successful projects in playing card history. In this episode, we talk strategies as he transitioned and left his career as an engineer to a full-time entrepreneur. His states of flow and how video games led to his current iconic company logo. We do geek out about magic a lot in this episode. I felt a little excited, as I always do when speaking or practicing the art of magic. However, we discuss a lot more and uncover some techniques and mindsets that Asad has used to allow him to run a successful company that he cares about, as well as a consistent, productive lifestyle. And now... Please take a listen and enjoy this long-awaited conversation with Asad Chaudhry. Thank you for being on the show, Asad. Sure thing. Happy to be here. Okay. In a few words, who are you, how are you, and what's the meaning of life? <laughs> the meaning of life? Snap. I didn't realize I was going to start off with such a deep question. Um, who am I? My name is Asad Chaudhry. Um, uh, what was the second oh, question? How are you? Today? How am I? I'm I'm doing good. It is a th- it's Thursday, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's been a pretty good Thursday uh, thus far. Productive, and uh, now we're just chilling. So that's pretty cool. And what is the meaning of life? Uh, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out for myself. I'm afraid that if I tried to give you an answer right now, it probably wouldn't be a very good one. Oh. Ask me again in like five years, and maybe <laughs> maybe I'll be able to hook you up. Well, hopefully, you'll be in the same. Same uh, response because we always want to not know. Yeah, we're it's true. To I think that's something, right? I think that's part of the appeal of all this is we're all just trying to figure it out. <laughs> and uh, I guess if you know too much, that ruins the mm-hmm. the essence of it. Well, we're going to talk about some magic, of course. But cool. before that, I wanted to ask you: Is there anything new or interesting that you've come across this last year outside of magic? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I study and research a lot of things outside of magic. Honestly, like where I'm currently at in life, I probably spend more time researching things that aren't magic related than are. Hmm. Um, because I, I guess I've kind of pivoted in, in a sort of way, whereas before I was um, almost solely focused on, you know, the learning and teaching of magic. But now like I run, uh, I run a business, an online business. And the skill set to to operate and grow a business is very different, completely different from you know the skill set that's involved in being a magician. So um, yeah, I, I in the last year I've learned a lot and studied a lot about just entrepreneurship in general, marketing, product development, branding, um, just lifestyle design is something that I think a lot about. Um, uh, you know, it's just I, I like to listen to talks and lectures about psychology like i'm interested in all these different areas that are related to what i do but um are certainly outside of the realm of magic Hmm. nice 
That's cool. I do as well. Yeah, I, there's so many things that uh, need to be researched. Yeah, uh, honestly, researching is like one of my favorite things. To really? Do. Yeah, and that's that's probably what I spend the most time on. Do you? What are your favorite sources for that? Oh, you... uh, there's so many. Like on Reddit, there's a subreddit for pretty much any topic you could possibly imagine. So if I find a new topic that I'm curious about, sometimes I'll go there because I like hearing voices from you know regular or quote-unquote ordinary people rather than mm. established uh, editorials and whatnot um but yeah honestly it depends on what i'm researching i'd like to read i like to listen to audiobooks youtube is probably and yeah, not probably is the greatest resource in the world for learning just about anything so, so i'll good. watch youtube videos um but yeah mo- most of my resources would be online i don't do much um, i do read some physical books but most of it's online great and uh, as far as creativity, what does that mean to you? Creativity. Um, if I guess if I had to define creativity, I would say it's, uh, um, hmm, gosh, that's, that's actually pretty difficult. <laughs> no, I would say it's, uh, you know, coming up with new ideas and, you know, manifesting them and turning them into a reality, you know, it's, um, you know, expressing yourself in, in ways that maybe you haven't before. It's finding new ways of communicating certain things that you find to be important. Um, but That's yeah, right yeah. That made sense. I'll, I'll stick with that one. I like that. <laughs> and what, uh, have you ever self-examined what uh, you do to get in such a good creative groove? Is there any setting or anything you do, any rituals that you partake in? Um... Honestly, I when I get into the zone and when I do what I do, I uh, it's actually pretty rare that I think of it as creativity, although it is. Hmm. Uh, I you know I focus on achieving a level of like productivity, and uh, I've been thinking about the concept of flow states a lot lately. Are you familiar with like being in flow? Yeah, is what they say is what they call it. Um, so I guess you could frame that as also being a state of creativity. It's somewhat similar, but yeah. I mean, I am absolutely trying to maximize the amount of time I spend in flow. And to do that, um, yeah, I mean, I think the key is that whatever task you have in front of you, whatever you're working on, it can't be so challenging that it deters you and makes you want to stop. And it can't be so easy that it just bores you. It's finding things to do in life that strike that balance. And once you hit that balance and it's both intriguing yet somewhat challenging, but interesting, then you reach the state of flow where you can spend hours and hours doing whatever that thing is and it doesn't feel like you're working, it doesn't feel like you're doing anything tedious, you're just living very naturally and you're being productive and you're making good things happen. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just getting into that state of flow and you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out the complete answer but um, you know, I, I've noticed a few things about myself is like my environment definitely matters a lot. So like there's certain things that I'll do like before I work or before I set out to do some kind of task, I take a look around in my environment. I try to make sure it's clean, not cluttered, because if my environment is cluttered, my mind ends up getting cluttered. Uh, or sometimes I'll just bounce. I'll go to like a coffee shop where it's just a good ambiance and it's good vibe, and I'll try to get into a flow state there. Um, but yeah, I, I have noticed a, a pretty profound uh, impact that environment has on my mental state and my ability to get into a flow state yeah and how did you uh, start becoming aware of flow state and when was it a long time ago? it was actually pretty recent well i think intuitively i i was familiar mm-hmm. and i understood the concept of flow i never really found the language for it until honestly just a couple of months ago cool um i was watching the joe rogan podcast and this there was this guy on there who was speaking very eloquently about the concept of a flow state and when i heard it i was like yes it's exactly like the perfect way to describe how we should be living you know i love that um he just had a really good way of articulating it and it clicked for me and i'm like yes okay this is you know i i i was intuitively doing it but now that i have the language for it and i have a better understanding for it i'm like actively working on it yeah that's cool being self-aware in that area can just lead to so many like longer for focus sessions probably yeah, right absolutely because you just know a, what works it's like it, doing this and this and this works yeah i think at the end of the day anything that we're trying to do whether you're just trying to get better at a certain skill or if you're in business you're trying to make sales or you're trying to whatever it is it comes down to a lot of repetitions that's how you get good at something you just you have to do it a lot and you, in order to do it a lot you have to be in a state of flow where you know you're not having to like push yourself unnaturally to do it no you do it because you want to do it 
and you do that long enough, you get enough repetitions, and you get really good at it. You you develop that sense of mastery. Yeah. What about distractions? Do you get distracted, and, and how sure. do you deal with them? What's any practices? Yeah, well, I let myself get distracted sometimes. Um, so, like, I'll take breaks. You know, video games are a distraction. <laughs> Netflix is a distraction. Um, but, yeah, I just try to let myself get distracted just in moderation. So usually if I achieve something or I get something done that was important and was like somewhat difficult, then I'll let myself take a little break, uh, half an hour, an hour, whatever. I'll watch some YouTube videos. I'll play a round of Overwatch, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, I just make sure I I get back to, you know, the task at hand, um, you know, in between these little break sessions. Yeah, breaks are good. Yeah, I had a big struggle with breaks most of my life. I'd yeah, like just keep going till I burned out. <laughs> yeah. And then I started realizing with the breaks, I could do better at what I'm doing. Absolutely, what I'm pushing for. Yeah, it's like you're recalibrating your focus. Yeah, that's that's a good way to say it. And uh, let let us talk about some magic now. Sure. How did you get involved in it? What what was the thing or the the oldest moment that inspired you to be a magician or to yeah well i think there was a few sparks that happened around the same time period um i remember well i remember seeing david blaine on tv his street magic special um and that was like right before i got into magic i saw that and um so i, I guess this was like 2001 maybe 2002 maybe some somewhere around that time frame and i'd never seen like close up magic before I never seen street magic I didn't even know that was a thing mm. like I think before that when I uh, thought of magicians I, I kind of thought of stage magic and mm. you know Vegas and like those big uh, props and whatnot and that that was never especially interesting to me but when I saw David Blaine doing like the street magic close up magic with just a deck of cards um, just a couple feet away from your face that blew me away like I, I it opened up a whole new world of things that I didn't know was possible and uh, it really encouraged me to like want to be able to do it too. And then around the same time frame, I remember uh, a friend of mine in high school or in middle school, excuse me. This was like the very end of middle school. He was, um, I didn't really think of it as magic at the time, but he was doing like these card manipulations, like making cards vanish mm -hmm. and reappear at the fingertips. It's like a sleight of hand thing that magicians do. And I was just so incredibly impressed by that that I wanted to learn how to do that as well. Um, so yeah, it kind of just set me on this journey where I would then uh, search for all this information. So it started off with um, just some books that I found at the public library. There were some online sources back in the day, not very many, and they weren't very good. But it wasn't your go-to like back then, right? It wasn't yeah, like something no. you just go to. No, uh, back then like it was very limited the amount of resources you could find online. And most of the stuff that you could find it just wasn't very well explained there wasn't much credibility behind the people who were trying to teach it and whatnot so i primarily learned through books was my main resource uh it started off just like the library then i got some at the bookstore and then eventually like i would order um some of the more serious books on magic through you know the internet and whatnot um but yeah it became an obsession like for a good number of years i became a sponge and i just mm -hmm. uh I tried to learn as much as I could. I exposed myself to as many different resources as I could. I practiced a lot. I put those repetitions in. And, um, you know, I, I never became like a, a professional magician. It was always a, a hobby for me. It was always just kind of a craft that I was interested in honing. But um, I ended up turning into my profession in a different way, not by performing, not by mm. being a professional ma magician, but uh, by building a, a company, a business that um, revolves around magic and playing cards and, and serves those who are also studying this craft and wanting to be magicians. So it's interesting how it kind of all came back full circle. Yeah, it's a blend. Yeah. Love and, and need for teaching and resources. It's, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where did you grow up? So I grew up uh, mainly in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Okay. Um, I bounced around a little bit uh, as a kid, but that's kind of where I spent most of my years growing up hmm. and were there so there weren't many magicians no there's only a few like um i was i was friends with a, a few uh, magicians in our school and i was like there there was only a few of us hmm. 
and I, outside of that, I didn't really know anyone else personally. Yeah, for those of you listening, uh, and you're not a magician, it's hard to find a magician when you're practicing magic. Yeah, I mean, probably less so now yeah. because now we have like social media, and it seems like through those platforms, um, you know, magicians are able to connect and eventually meet in person. But back then, it was a different game. Like back then, we didn't really have social media, and it was actually I remember getting really excited anytime I met someone who was interested in magic. Um, because it was so rare yeah it's rare you know hmm. but i also think that, that was probably part of the appeal as well like part of the reason why i wanted to learn and get good at it is because yeah it's just something that not very many other people could do so i guess maybe it set it set me apart in a way mm-hmm. and i kind of like that and it was kind of a unique factor mm-hmm. um did you but, yeah, uh, perform for your family growing up or sometimes yeah was it were, were you ever nervous performing for your family or does that just like you were close with family? Not for my family. I was definitely nervous performing for strangers sometimes, okay. like, growing up. But for my family, like, it never really mattered. They got pretty sick of it pretty fast. <laughs> right. You keep <laughs> wanting to show someone something to practice on. Right, right, And they're right. like, um, all right. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, it's it's definitely a good idea for those of you who are listening who are, like, getting into magic. Like, yeah, that's how you start. You practice on your, your brothers or your parents or whatever it is. And then once you're comfortable enough with that, then you, you can move on to, to people who aren't as close to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm still nervous practicing, practicing magic, but it's right after I do one solid trick, I, I do get into a flow with people. Yeah. The only thing I'm, I'm kind of concerned about sometimes is like you, you have to know when to stop, right? Yeah. You don't want to go on too long. No. That, that can ruin the vibe. Yeah. and or You want to end strong. Chance to like have someone catch something you maybe didn't want them to catch or yeah, yeah, you yeah. want to keep them missing, uh, guessing. And, right, right. There's like, there's a whole craft to routining uh-huh. it and timing everything correctly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you want to leave them wanting more for sure. Mm-hmm. Like that's like a good place to end. And did you, when did you start your YouTube channel? Yeah. So the YouTube channel started, um, pretty shortly after I graduated college. So it was 2011 and um yeah i mean it started off as just something i was doing on the side i was um you know after graduating school i went to school for electrical engineering something Mm. completely different and i ended up working as an electrical engineer for um a few years after graduating so this is just something that i would do when i would come home from work like i loved youtube i loved the youtube ecosystem i loved magic and i felt like i just want to do something outside of work that is you know enjoyable to me and that i think could be beneficial to other people and just something to keep me occupied so i would come home from work and i would start filming the, these videos and um yeah i mean it started off pretty like pretty bare bones i was just using like a flip camera mm-hmm. i didn't really do any fancy editing or anything um it was just uh, me talking to a camera but those videos caught on and got a lot of traction and a lot of people really um um, really gravitated towards them so I just kept doing it over the years and years and um, here we are hmm. but yeah it started uh, back in 2011 did you when you posted your first video or first few did you do anything to try to get people to like see the videos or do they just start yeah um, well I was somewhat lucky in the sense that the way that I actually got started on YouTube I guess I should have mentioned this in the last uh, answer but hmm. um I won a contest. So there was this guy who already had a pretty established uh, YouTube channel in the magic niche. And he would host these contests every now and then saying like, hey, submit uh, your video for the best card trick or whatever it was. Um, his name is Miss Mag, Miss Mag 822. Mm. Maybe you've seen some of his videos. Mm. Uh, he used to be like the, you know, one of the biggest, uh, he probably still is. He, I, he doesn't really upload all that much anymore, I don't believe. But back in the day, his channel was the place to go. And so, yeah, like I entered this contest, you know, like thousands of people entered and I ended up winning it. Wow. Um, and this was like right after I graduated college. So after winning it, like I got some immediate recognition from that. Some people who were watching his channel ended up subscribing to mine. Um, you know, in retrospect, it wasn't much. Like it was maybe two, 3,000 subscribers that I was able to pull in mm. um, within the first few months of my channel. Um, but... At the time, that was huge, and getting started oftentimes is the hardest part, you know. So I had an initial, like, small subscriber base that were watching my videos, and as I continued to upload consistently, that subscriber base just grew and grew. Mm. Um, It was most of it was pretty organic growth. Like I didn't Mm. do too much in terms of strategy to get people to watch. I just um, 
I just kept creating content. My subscribers kept seeing it. And then, um, you know, I got more and more subscribers. I ended up building a website off the back of the YouTube channel to better organize all the content and just to have a place to direct the, the viewers to. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just uh, it was just being consistent over a long period of time. I think that's the key strategy, really, mm. when it comes to content. That's cool. You won the contest. What what was the effect that you did? Yeah, I mean, it was a really cool trick. It was called a card trick that never happened, and it's a pretty long trick and it's kind of abstract. But essentially, you start off by showing that the deck is completely mixed up and like it's just a shuffle deck of cards. You go through all these steps where you separate the colors out and you do these things. And then you go back in time, eventually show that, hey, this is the card trick that never happened because we're in the exact same position that we started out in five minutes ago. And it, it's 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 a cool concept. Um, nice. Very cool trick. Hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it won, which was pretty amazing. Damn. Where, what did you do when you... Did, how did you celebrate? Did you? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I, like, I actually celebrated. I remember coming home from work that day and seeing my inbox flooded because i used to get like email notifications every time someone you subscribe to my channel mm -hmm. and my inbox was flooded with like <laughs> 100 200 emails which was like a big deal back then yeah like right, right after um i won and that was really exciting for me i remember that emotion <laughs> it's like wow something's happening here. this is amazing cool hmm. and now from that 52 cards developed can you give us a rundown of what that is and how, well, how yeah, so I mean, it's kind of transcended and kind of um, uh, expanded, I should say, into a number of different areas. So it started out as the YouTube channel, where I would uh, teach sleight of hand and magic and card tricks and things like that. Um, but then, as I mentioned earlier, I built a website off of it, um, and then eventually I started. Um, I well, I created like an online course. You know, so YouTube has a lot of you know the Fifty Two Cards YouTube channel, a bunch of free resources available. Uh, but I ended up creating a course for those of like the more dedicated students who wanted to invest a bit more and get a more comprehensive resource that was um, neatly organized and structured. So I did that, and that was like my first venture into the business side of things. Mm. It was a Kickstarter project. It did really well. I raised money for thirty days to, you know, fundraise the the the, the money needed to produce a project mm. such as that. Um, it did super well. Blew past the funding goal. And then once that happened, I realized like, oh snap, this is um, like there's a career in this. This is like a, if I do it right, I can build a long term, sustainable and successful business off of this um, the student base that I have, off of this audience that I have. So from there, I um, I built an online shop selling uh, a variety of things, specializing in custom decks of playing cards. You know, so for those of you or for those of people out there who are interested in magic, the vast majority of them just almost by default are also very interested and passionate about a deck of playing cards. Yeah. This is the tool that we use most often and for a variety of good reasons. Um, and so there's a whole industry behind playing cards now, you know, in the past when we were growing up and we got into magic, uh, you know, if you're using a deck of cards, chances are you're using a deck of bicycle yeah. or maybe a deck of B if you're feeling yeah. like borderless or whatever. <laughs> there was only like a few decks of cards that were available to us. Well, now it's completely different. Now you have this massive industry of, you know, some of the top artists and designers in the world using a deck of cards as their canvas to express their art and to create these amazingly beautiful decks of cards. There's thousands of different types of designs and decks that you can get, different manufacturers, different card stocks, different, you know, all these different variations. And um, this is my main business now is I, I sell custom decks of playing cards. And I, more recently, I now also produce my own decks of cards. Um, and it's just very related to you know all the content that I created in the past, which was how to do cool things with the deck of cards. Now it's like okay, well now let me sell you cool decks of cards, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. So um, you know, yeah, it's it's gone through a number of different phases. Fifty two cards. Um, I, I also released a, an app. I guess that was last year. Now that's that's one of my favorite apps. Yeah. I mean, I go to all the time when I want to relearn stuff or. Yeah. or just see the new it's, stuff you can. You it's basically packing the whole fifty two cards ecosystem into one yeah. one app where you can just find it all. It's all easy to navigate and everything. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank sure you. thing. I'm glad, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad you're getting good use out of it. That's good to hear. Um, so yep. yeah, I mean that's that's kind of where we're at now. It's been uh, I guess almost uh, how long has it been? Eight eight years now, almost seven eight years. Wow. Um, 
but um, it's it's exciting to think about all the different ways that it's grown in. When did you, or was there a moment when you really, you transferred in um, into, how can I put this, you transferred from maybe other so regular sources of income, I want to say, into mm-hmm. this business, yeah. and you, like, you actually, the wow, I can make enough revenue from my company now i don't have to take side work or do something yeah yeah so i quit my job in engineering um in uh gosh what year was it i think it was 2014 i want to say so that was like a couple years after i'd been doing youtube i realized like okay like i don't if i play my cards right if i make the right moves i don't need my day job anymore um so it got to the point where i was able to like pay my living expenses and whatnot just through the online revenue i was making through 52 cards and it, it, it just occurred to me that, hey, well, if I um, spend all this time that I'm spending at my day job and instead mm-hmm. invest it into 52 cards, like I can just grow this into an even bigger business and I won't, I won't need, you know, the salary anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's what I did and it ended up working out. Was it um, a decision that was, you were nervous about doing or you yeah. just knew? Oh, no, I was how nervous. How did you handle that? Well, like I, I, I had a feeling like it was going to happen eventually. Like I, I wanted it to happen for a yeah. while, but I was nervous about finding the right time. And I was nervous about, um, you know, like what if it doesn't work out or like what if, uh, you know, I end up, uh, you know, bringing a lot of financial stress on myself. Uh, but so I waited, I waited a long time. I waited to a point where I felt safe, where mm-hmm. I felt like it wasn't too, too risky. Um, I waited till I had a large loyal audience I waited till I was able to like pay my living expenses just through you know the passive revenue I was making. Mm-hmm. So I felt safe, but it was still a stressful time. It was still um, yeah, a big deal. Yeah, still definitely um, some anxiety there, mm-hmm. nervous. And now, how did you manage time if you were working? Were you working full time like most of the time when you were developing Fifty Two Cards? Mm-hmm. You were working full time engineering or whatever. Yeah. How it, did you handle and man- manage that? Yeah, I mean, it was um, it was. You know, with with some difficulty for sure. I was spending all day. It was a full time job. Uh, you know, in the lab and the engineering side of things. And then, yeah, I would come home and I would try to squeeze in at least a few more hours before going to sleep, just working on, you know, the side project because I wanted that side project to be the main thing. Um, but it just had to be in a certain place before I could make that happen. So, yeah, I would try to you know I would try to balance that out um, and just. Um, you know, put some time aside for when I got home to, to work on this, the second job, essentially. Did you, didn't um, turn down a lot of social life to like really hit yeah. that? Is that what- yeah, no, I definitely, uh, I think naturally I am kind of an introverted guy. Mm-hmm. So maybe that even played to my, it was kind of an advantage for me that like I had extra time, you know, by myself where I could invest it into something, um, you know, productive and useful. But yeah, I mean, I definitely did sacrifice certain um, social um, uh, a social lifestyle, you know, in order to, you know, put all that time into the business. But I'm glad I did, you know, yeah. it, it definitely worked out for the best. During, let's see, uh, during the whole 52 cards production and the uh, business, what are some of the small things that you've done or that you, if you realize them that have really given you the best results? Hmm. Small things that have produced the biggest results. And it could be for um, just the business running smooth, smoother than before. It could be, uh, I don't know, creating the next mint deck of cards. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if I had more time to think about that, I might be able to give you a better answer. But at the top of my head right now, I would say um, I think about timing a lot. And, um, you know, just trying not to get burnt out. So, like, understanding myself and how I operate to avoid um, just any stages of, uh, you know, not being productive and whatnot. Um, Yeah, like, I, I I think about consistency a lot. I um I think one thing that I did I don't know I don't know if I would consider this a small thing but it definitely had a big impact. Mm-hmm. I built my business and my brand in a very uh, lean way. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is I made sure that I built it in a way that didn't require too much day-to-day operational maintenance. And by doing so I was able to focus on the big picture. I was able to stay consistent with the content and you know run the shop. Um, you know, I implemented some, you know, pretty powerful software 
um, on the back end of things in the shop that helps it run smoothly. Mm -hmm. So these are like small things that, um, you know, that they go a long way. Mm. So staying lean. That's cool. I low think, overhead. And, yeah, yeah, low overhead. I think a mistake that a lot of people make when trying to get into entrepreneurship or just trying to make money online or whatever is they, um, they grow too fast almost. They can't sustain it. Mm. They don't have the infrastructure in place to maintain mm -hmm. The, the operations so it's it's better to stay super super lean um to minimize just like the moving parts and uh and just stay focused on doing a few things really well mm. can you name some of can we do a little tech talk uh, the uh stuff behind the website that makes it smooth what what kind yeah. of recommendations or what have you found out yeah, I mean, well, I've um, I've dabbled with a few different uh, like platforms to run the business. Right now, like the the business is running on a few different platforms for those who are interested in the tech side of things. So I've got um, I'm using WordPress, which is a popular content management system to handle all of the content that's hosted on the site. I'm using Shopify mm -hmm. um, to power the shop, and you know they're. I, I've dabbled with different options that are available, and from what I've seen, they're definitely the best when it comes to e-commerce um, and handling uh, transactions and orders and fulfillment and all that stuff. Uh, for the courses, I'm running a platform called Teachable, um, which structures uh, you know all the content into these really easy to navigate lesson modules. So I really like that a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean. Uh, I, I have it all tied into one place, so the amount of maintenance required at this point, like I, I've outsourced the warehousing and the fulfillment of all the orders in the shop that used to be in-house, um, which was a very daunting task, but that's one thing that I did to help streamline the whole process. Now I have a warehouse where all the inventory is stored and everything gets shipped out every day. Can you day. talk about how you transitioned into that and how did you research and find that? Or Yeah, uh, I, to be honest, I can't talk too much about that okay. um, just because it's kind of a, a unique situation and it's oh. it's a little bit under wraps right Interesting. now. Interesting. Um, but I mean, there are fulfillment centers uh, everywhere. Every city has them. But you'd recommend once you, if you have so much going on in your own home, you yeah, need to get that. You need to stop fulfilling things yourself because that's just going to drain so much energy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tell this to people who are doing the Kickstarter projects because you know a key part of Kickstarter is fulfillment. You know, after you um, produce your item, you have to ship out a bunch of packages, and if you're doing that yourself, you're sacrificing so much time that could be better spent elsewhere. There are warehouses, there are companies that specialize in doing just that, and they do a good job. It, they charge you, but it's usually worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What about uh, some of the biggest mistakes during this process of uh, growing the business? Um, that maybe taught you some, some vi yeah. valuable... Um, I think what I'm realizing now is um, I probably should have tried to recruit other people to help to help out with the business earlier because for a long long time and even now it's largely a one-man show mm -hmm. but i've started to now delegate and bring in people who can help with different aspects of the business and i, I found that it can be incredibly helpful and it can help me focus on the big picture stuff the stuff that really matters like i want to work on the business instead of inside of the business if that makes sense yeah so um biggest mistake would be yeah like i so, sometimes i wish like maybe maybe two years ago or like maybe a while ago, I should have started um, finding the right people to connect with and, and to align with and, you know, and, and bring them on board. And, and I did, I did dabble in that, but I probably didn't pursue it as strongly as I should have. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm doing now and I'm finding it to be um, beneficial. Great. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it, partnership. You can do so much more than just even the great individual and you have all this p passion. It's, it can be, like you said, daunting and draining. And, yeah. And then you can't uh, put your efforts elsewhere, the larger. Yeah, yeah, idea. absolutely. Hmm. And what about advice for someone wanting to uh, start an entrepreneurship of their own or maybe become an entrepreneur? If they're just yeah. starting out, and they, what are some things they should consider, questions they should ask themselves? Yeah. Um, I think um, there's definitely a lot of appeal in entrepreneurship nowadays. I think a lot of people are kind of chasing the, the potential lifestyle that can come with it. Uh, and it makes sense. Like, it's a pretty cool lifestyle if you're able to attain it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy game. Like, 
it takes a lot of focus, a lot of persistence, a lot of patience. Um, so I guess my advice would be, you know, if you're going to start a venture of some sort in entrepreneurship, you have to make sure it's something that you genuinely like really like and that you can see yourself doing for years, something that you can spend time every day on. And ideally, it's not going to feel like work for you. Ideally, it's something that, you know, it's just something that you want to do. And then eventually, if you end up getting paid for it, awesome, right? That's like the, the best case scenario. Um, but yeah, just expect uh, to have, um, you know, a lot of patience because it takes time to build something. And to build something meaningful takes a lot of time. Um, but yeah, just keep researching, keep studying, keep executing. Like, I know a lot of people who are into entrepreneurship, they have all these amazing ideas and it seems like they have the right vibe and energy, but they they don't execute. They don't actually make moves. They don't pull any triggers. And, uh, you know, it's hard to do those things. It's hard to start, but you have to. And um, even if you don't feel completely 100% ready, like maybe you don't have the exact equipment that you want to have, or maybe you, your idea isn't completely fleshed out, uh, it's better to start anyways. And you'll figure that out as you go along and you'll slowly improve your whole process. Um, but yeah, just, just getting started. Getting started is the hardest part and it's the most important part. I agree. Yeah, just jump jump out of the train. Try not to roll too yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Hey, I wanted to ask you the logo you have. I love, by the way. Okay, so right. On. How did that? Did you help design it? Did you hire someone? How did, <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. That logo has been the same since the very beginning. It's like eight years old. I've thought about getting an update, but I'm like, gosh, it's just become like an iconic thing. And the way that it came about is kind of kind of random. Um, I didn't really have money to spend on the logo at the time, like because this was early, early days, 52 cars before it was making any money or anything. Mm -hmm. So um, I used to play this video game. I was kind of obsessed with it called Diablo 2. Mm. Have you heard of Diablo? No. It's a game that Blizzard made. It's still they, it, like it's still out there, but um, Blizzard is the same company that makes like Warcraft and Overwatch and whatnot. So um, I was like obsessed with this game in college. Diablo 2 was the second one, and in the game there was like a a built-in economy based off of like digital gold and you know there were items that you could get so i actually like my initial business training so to speak um occurred through this video game and i used my um my digital currency in this video game to pay a designer who i met through the game to build a logo for me Whoa. so i paid like a thousand gold which I don't know, it's probably like two, two dollars. I don't know. And was it you? After playing a long time, you just you've collected it. I, I accumulated a lot of gold. I was very wealthy in and that game. Yeah, and people <laughs> love, like, if they're really into the game, they they will literally do work for digital currency. It's, yeah, it's great. Incredible. Yeah. So there was there was like a, a whole market built inside this game where you could trade gold for items. You could trade gold for services. Um, I was a part of a forum that was attached to, you know, the game. And, you know, that's where a lot of these transactions would take place. So, yeah, I... I Forget college, guys. Just play video <laughs> just, games. Just play games. With digital currency, you'll, you'll know the insides. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's how I got my logo. I paid using digital gold in a video game and it ended up being an amazing logo and I'm still using it eight years later. That's great. Yeah. Huh. I would have never guessed. Yeah. <laughs> I should probably reach out to that guy and be like, yo, like... Your logo is doing great. Yeah, it's doing great work. <laughs> Thank <residuals>. you. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh -huh. Wow. Hmm. Okay, and uh, what about... Maybe this is too similar to the other mistakes, but what do you think is the biggest waste of time running a business? Mm. The biggest waste of time... Or the um, things you shouldn't do if you're running a business that you've, you've uh, come across. Yeah, honestly, I think that answer really depends so much on the type of business that we're talking about here. Um, I guess for me, like, what's been the biggest waste of time? Yeah, I mean, probably, like, trying to fulfill orders myself. Like, as I mentioned before, that was a pretty big time consumer. Mm -hmm. um, but... On, uh, I'm hesitant to label anything really a waste of time because if you're spending time in a way that isn't the most productive, well, you're learning at least. So like I I can't really pinpoint any th areas where I felt like I've wasted time. Um, I think over the years I've learned what tasks or what, you know, things that I could do 
to spend time most effectively. Mm -hmm. And I think that is planning like these big Kickstarter projects. Those tend to get the biggest return on investment in terms of my time and my resources. Um, Content has a great return on investment. Creating a great piece of content can generate a lot of views and traffic years after the video has been published. Mm -hmm. Um, Building systems that help manage and take care of some of these smaller daunting tasks, like building that system is a very valuable use of time. Um, But yeah, I think before you realize all those things, you do have to quote unquote waste time doing those lesser meaningful tasks, Mm. but then you figure it out. Hmm. And speaking of Kickstarter, what are, I've never, I've, okay, I've edited a video for some Kickstarters before. (laughs) I have made them some good money actually, Yeah. but I never did the campaign and did all that other work. Yeah. yeah, And I see my future starting one perhaps for a couple endeavors. Yeah. So what advice, what thoughts or a couple musts I should be aware of or ever yeah listening. well Kickstarter is a, an amazing amazing platform for, it can be you know um, I see some projects that are terrible and then you have some projects who never even follow through on what their project was but you know it's an amazing platform for those who use it effectively um, so I guess for those listening who maybe aren't 100% familiar with Kickstarter essentially it's a crowdfunding platform and uh, what that is is basically it's a community where if you're a project creator, if there's some project out there that you really want to do, that you really want to execute, um, but you need support, you know, a lot, oftentimes these big projects require um, a great deal of funding. Well, you can create a project page on Kickstarter saying, hey, here's my project. Here's what I want it to be. Here's the idea. Um, please support it. If you do support it now, once the project is complete, I'm going to send you the final product. That's kind of the the contract of Kickstarter. That's the basic concept of how it works. So, um, you know, some people spend a lot of time putting together a Kickstarter project and ends up raising $3. It's a miserable failure. Like, it just doesn't work. And other people create a project and it raises millions of dollars, you know? So, yeah, there's definitely, like, a a strategy. There's definitely uh, uh, good things that you can do, effective things that you can do, and there's things that you should avoid doing. I think um, the biggest factor when it comes to launching a Kickstarter project is before you launch your project, you should already have access to a strong group of people who are going to be interested in that project. A lot of people try to start a project from scratch. Like they don't have an audience. They just put the project up on Kickstarter and then they just try to wait, but no one's going to find it. Like people have to have a way of knowing about the project before they're going to support it. So um, my number one advice would be like, yeah, before you launch that project, figure out what type of people would be interested in this project and how do I connect with them now so that when it comes time around to release that project, they're already going to be warm and they're already going to be um, interested in potentially supporting that project. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. And that's a trick in itself. I mean, that's it's a, that's a whole... Yeah, and so how whatever. do you build that audience? Um, how do you build that potential customer base or backer base, as we would call it on Kickstarter? Well, I mean, we're lucky to live in the digital age now, and there's so many different platforms now that allow you to do that. It could be, for me, it was primarily YouTube. Mm-hmm. Instagram is great. I use Instagram. Email marketing is great. I use email marketing. Snapchat, podcasting, what you're doing right now, this is a great way to connect with potential backers, potential customers, potential whatever. Um, like we have all these different platforms and it really just depends on your niche it depends on the type of content that you're creating Um, different platforms are optimized for you know uh, different things so you have to kind of make that judgment call and figure out what platform is best for you sometimes it's going to be multiple platforms we just start creating great content start connecting with people build that trust build build that credibility and then when it comes time to um, build a project or create a project Obviously, you have to pick a project that's very relevant to the audience that you have, something that they're going to be very interested in. You have to set up reward packages that make sense, that are appealing. And then you have to do a hell of a good job at just marketing it. Yeah. You reach out to the people you're already warm with, and they're enthusiastic. And it's like a snowball effect. Yeah. Um, Because once once a project already has a lot of success, other people want to jump on the back wagon and Mm -hmm. also support it. That's great. So right now you, uh, well, you finished your your first um, deck of cards was mint. Was that your very first? Yeah. Or? So the first one was mint. That was back in 2016. Amazing deck, people. Yeah. The best cards I've ever felt in my hands. Yeah, I'm so I happy to like say six, that. I bought like six, 
<laughs> and I brought them to the Philippines on my trip. Yeah. And I used them all there, but the weather was like, it's a very more humid. humid so, like, I, they kind of had their toll. And I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. No, I still have a couple in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Mintz was 2016. That was the first deck I ever did. Um, like, yeah, crazy project. Mintz 2 just finished. Yeah. And that just took it to a whole nother level. That's so, awesome. I'm currently working on producing them right now, but the Kickstarter campaign just ended like last month, close to two months ago now. It broke records, became one of the most successful projects ever on Kickstarter, Damn. you know, for playing cards and that's, whatnot. That's great. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm really really excited to actually like see the final product and get them in everyone's hands. Yeah. So that's what's been on my mind lately. It's kind of stressful. Uh, yeah, I could imagine <laughs> there is a lot to oversee. And yeah, and there's a lot of backers who are like, you know, waiting. And so like that weighs on me. <laughs> like, um, but hey, I'm I'm excited. I'm confident. Like I've done this before i know what i'm I'm much much more prepared this time around than i was last time around um the infrastructure is much stronger this time around so yeah it's i i have a great feeling about it you know it's just going through all those baby steps and you know getting everything ready to go and how did you do, um i forgot if i read it or not but how did you design the first mint and the and the second mint? yeah so i actually didn't design it myself it was a collaboration i found um uh, I met the designer and I saw this deck that he had designed and um, I love the design so much that I, I acquired it from him and said, hey, I want to produce this deck. Like I had never produced a deck before. Like I, I wanted to produce a deck for many, many yeah. years, but I had never come across a design that I liked so much that I wanted to produce myself. Mm. It's a lot of work to produce a deck. Um, but when I saw this design, I was like, this is the one. And he, um, he he had this design, which was great, but he didn't have the audience. He didn't have the customer base. So he wasn't really in a position to produce himself. So he just grabbed, like, produced a couple for himself or some people? or uh, Yeah, he had, like, a prototype. Okay. Yeah. And he had some mock-ups, like, digital mock-ups. But I said, hey, like, let me acquire this, this design from you. I'll, I'll do it big. I'll make this deck a, a worldwide phenomenon. And, like, yeah, it actually ended up happening. That's great. No, yeah. Okay. Is it coming back? How can I ever get that? I can't, right? They're well, the original ones you can, you but can. Mint Two okay. like is going to be available no, again. You, I, I, you probably can't say this, but are you ever planning on come bringing back the Mint One ever again? That I mean, th those decks won't come back. Now, maybe though, I'll use the similar color schemes in the future, okay. in the future editions, but it'll be a completely different deck. Wow. So, like that's another aspect of this is that the decks that I've produced they've become very collectible. Um, so like the original decks, they originally sold for $10, uh -huh. but if you go on eBay now, yeah, they're up just there. the regular ones are selling for like 50. And then there was a limited edition deck that they sold during that first Kickstarter project. Golden black. Was it? Golden yeah, black? it was golden black. It was called the limited edition <laughs> mince deck. Um, it was selling for $15 during the Kickstarter. If you go on eBay now, it sells for $200, $300 sometimes per deck, Dang. which is insane. That so is yeah, I mean, those decks definitely won't come back. Like they're highly collectible items. They're limited editions. Um, that won't be reprinted mm. um, but you know this mint design pattern is kind of iconic now and that's going to live on I love but, it you know it's not going to be the same as that original launch edition deck mm -hmm. and then mint 2 is it's there, the cherry look right isn't that nice yeah well so mint 2 introduced a few new flavors and a few design updates to the uh, mint design so the, now there's the blueberry oh, oh there's cucumber yeah I'll show you some pictures yeah, I must have missed it I thought I just only saw the cherry thing yeah no oh that's another deck oh. that uh, I'm selling I didn't oh, produce that one okay oh I yeah, see yeah. Oh. I do sell the cherry casino playing cards which are also very popular yeah, yeah, yeah. 52 cards is one of the main um, authorized retailers for that deck okay uh, but Mint is the first design that I'm actually producing yeah, myself yeah and I see I, that's why I, I remember like you were gonna have more flavors and I was I was looking forward to them. I somehow maybe missed it or yeah yeah no it's, it's very recent like it just happened yeah, yeah. wow um so the Kickstarter is over now, so they're not technically available at the moment. But once they're produced, then I'll, I'll have some extra inventory to, awesome. to sell. But every time I do a Kickstarter project, I always um, release some Kickstarter exclusive items that are only available to the backers who support the project. So I did that once again for this project, the Frost Mint decks is what I'm calling them. And those won't be available cool. again. Wow. Yeah. That's exciting. Second, second Kickstarter, huge, better than before. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hmm. Damn. Okay, now when it's all overwhelming and everything's like, I need a break, what do you do? <laughs> um, How do you recharge? I, um, I like film a lot. I like watching TVs and movies, good TV, good movies. Like That's one way I wind down. Um, I'm somewhat of a gamer. Okay. I, I like to practice guitar. I play guitar. Oh, yes, I see. Um, I like walking. 
<laughs> what really? Yeah, I just walk around else. downtown That's sometimes. Uh, I like going to coffee shops. Um, like I'm a pretty chill guy. I don't do anything too crazy. Uh, some most of it's pretty low key. But um, yeah, if I'm not working, I'm usually just relaxing in one of those ways. Cool. Yeah. Any strange, funny, absurd things you you do that people know you by? <laughs> strange, <laughs> absurd, funny. Not that I can think of, to You're be honest. You're a magician. That's enough. Yeah, <laughs> magician is probably the strangest thing about me, maybe. <laughs> it is. It's the funniest thing when you tell someone you're a magician. Like, yeah, like it's usually a real strange reaction. Like, oftentimes I won't. I actually won't introduce myself as a magician. I, sometimes I, I don't wear it on my sleeve. Like, mm-hmm. if I get to know someone, then eventually it'll come up. But yeah. um, nowadays, depending on who I'm talking to, like, if, in, if I'm in the magic circle, then sure, I'll be like, yeah, I'm a magician. Mm-hmm. If I'm not in the magic circle, I usually don't start with that. Because mm-hmm. it is kind of strange. Yeah, and people don't really know how to take it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've noticed for for me over the years, I would I would be like, okay, I want people to like me first, and then they see I'm a magician. And yeah, then they I think it's super better. Like me, I think it's a better approach. Yeah, like I I don't like it, or I think it's a bad move when people try to use magic as their crutch. Yes, you know, and they like replace everything else about them to just be this magician. You know. Um, if it becomes too strong of a part of your identity, I feel like that's dangerous. Yeah, it's like a mask. People yeah. hide behind it, which is it, not good. It, right, yeah. exactly. Hmm. Um, so I've thought about that a lot, and I'm still trying to figure it out, like what my identity is and all this. <laughs> like It goes through phases. It's always transforming. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very rewarding craft, a very rewarding hobby if you use it right, if you use it in the right context and with the right vibe, it's powerful. Yeah. If you use it with the wrong vibe, the right con and the wrong context, it can be kind of cringeworthy. And it gets you have a to bad. Be, yeah, it gets a bad rap. Yeah, you have to be careful. <laughs> Watch your back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially the black magic. I'm not going to get into that. Black magic. What do you mean? Well, you know, there's the black magic. Oh, like actual magic? <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, people are weary of that. I, I was in the Philippines performing magic, and they. Oh, I don't want to see this one lady. Yeah. I do not want to see any magic. She was like, Yeah, away the way from that me. they perceive magic in certain locations is very different from the way we perceive it out here. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's still certain cultures that very much believe and are scared of like voodoo mm-hmm. and like actual black magic. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you do have to be careful how you mm-hmm. present it. So, as a teacher, can, what, uh, any, can you give us three top tips um, about magic? Like what could really you could focus on to just up your game and continue the yeah growth. sure um, I mean magic is um, it's it's an interesting craft to practice because most of what you're practicing when done correctly is never seen by your audience it's like secret moves secret sleight of hand techniques right so um, you know it's it's a little bit different in that regard but I, I guess what I would say is it's much better to practice a few things just like a few tricks a few effects and get really really good at them as opposed to learning like dozens of effects that you're just kind of good at you'll get much more mileage if you just get good at a few and you get really good at them and um you know after you practice for a while you realize that it's so much more than just yeah obviously you want your technique to be good you want it to be smooth and clean um but once your technique is down then really the most of the impact that you're going to have just come comes across in the way that you communicate in the way that you present the effect, in the way that you present yourself. And uh, it's just a matter of aligning who you are as an individual with you know, this thing that you're trying to show them. Um, and um, yeah, just a little bit of magic can go a long ways, really. I think I have trouble, I either will talk too much <laughs> when I'm doing magic, because <laughs> I, I have always, in my head, I've always said, like, I want to, uh, patter for people that don't know yeah. what that is that, can you explain that patter is a term that we use to uh, it essentially means the, the dialogue um, that you're using while performing a trick so good patter patter done right sounds very natural very spontaneous but it's not it's very heavily rehearsed yeah. uh, the best magicians in the world like they, they come across as very smooth very seamless but it's all like a lot of repetition and um, that's key. So having good patter is a big deal. It's very important. Uh, but then it, once you get good enough, you can get to the point where you can kind of just freestyle. And you don't really need that patter anymore. Mm-hmm. But in the beginning stages, it's very important for you to um, script what you're saying. Because you know what you're doing has to match with what you're saying very cleanly in, in order for it to make sense to the audience. So you want to script out the trick and time everything you say with the motions that you're doing with your hands and whatnot. 
Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, that, that good pattern really goes a long way. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm always battling with, uh, trying to misdirect with like, with, and I speak too much sometimes. Yeah. And then I'm like, Oh wait, I gotta do the trick, you know? <laughs> right. I, and then I don't want to do the trick too fast. It's always, it's the ba- having that right balance. And when you get in the flow, like we were talking about before, that's obviously the best. And when you're done with it, you should self reflect and figure out like, how did I get in that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, mm. No, that's a good point. And I mean, that magic, the cool thing about magic, we deal with people a lot and mm-hmm. relationships. Mm-hmm. Anything uh, you have to say about dealing with people, like um, keeping people happy? I mean, I just, just mm. off topic, like, you know, we always have to deal with people, especially as a business too. You, you have probably a lot of irate people that are like, where's my mint? <laughs> and you, you know, we have to deal with these people. That's actually something I'm working on right now. A system that I'm building is I'm trying to build the best customer support uh, system in the magic and playing card industry. Cool. For a long time, it was me handling all the customer support myself. And I did a good job. But it gets overwhelming. It's hard to scale and grow if I'm doing everything myself. So right now I'm building a team of uh, customer support agents who are just really good and will um, handle customer and deal with customers in a really um, effective way. Um, but wait, how, what was the original question? How did I get into that? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, dealing with people. Yeah, keeping uh, them happy. Yeah, so you can't make everybody happy, but um, I think um, I, I've basically adopted this mindset where it's like I'm not for everyone. I don't expect everyone to like me. Mm. I don't want everyone to like me. I'm like I'm I'm for a specific type of person, you know, and the, the type of people who get it, they're gonna get it, and they're gonna like me, and they're gonna they're going to vibe with the, the energy that I'm putting out and the content that I'm putting out and cool. That's the way it should be. So if I, um, yeah, I, I just don't, I don't pay much attention honestly to the people who, who are not into it and that's fine. Like you don't have to be into it. Like, everyone has their own preferences. Everyone has their own things that they're interested in. Um, and, and, and it's cool. I think it's just like an abundance mentality. It's like, Hey, I've got, Plenty. There are plenty of people out there who are into it. Let's focus on those people. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Where can people find all that is you out there in the internet land? Uh, yeah. So I mean, most people know me from Fifty Two Cards. That's numerical five two, then cards with a K, K A R D S. So you can find Fifty Two Cards on YouTube, Fifty Two Cards dot com. The shop is at shop dot Fifty Two Cards dot com. On Instagram, there's a Fifty Two Cards app on the app store, the Google play store. So yeah, it's everywhere. Just whichever cool platform, um, is most uh, relevant to you. Like 52 cards is probably there. Um, but yeah, so me personally, like I'm more like behind the scenes of 52 cards. Um, so I, I guess the title that I've given myself is creative director. That's how I think about myself. Cool. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, I'll, I'll put all that in the show notes. Sweet. On the website and fake it till you make it.com. There we go. And um, wrapping up, I have a couple last questions. Sure. And I wanted to ask, uh, let's see. I feel comfortable enough to ask you this. Mm-hmm. Um, a tombstone in a tombstone in the future. What would you have written on there? Ooh, that's deep. Man. I I haven't even thought. I haven't thought that far ahead. Like, <laughs> I would need. I would need a lot of time to think about that. Um, yeah, I can't even respond. It's a deep question, and it's probably it's a very important question now that I think about it. Yeah. But I, I'm just I'm so focused on living right now that yes, I, I haven't begun yeah. thinking about death. Hmm. Um, okay. But maybe I should. It's important to understand where we're all going to go. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic. Yeah, I don't right. have a good answer for you though. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> all right. Um, and any what what would you suggest people? people that want to study magic um, besides of course your resources are great uh-huh. but like one essential book or, or documentary or something you yeah uh, I think the go to reference that um, you know most beginners tend to cling to and for good reason is it's a book called The Royal Road to Card Magic yeah. by Gene Hugard Gene Hugard excuse me um, actually there's two authors who's the other author of that book Hugard and ba- Bowie or hmm. uh, the other name is escaping me but um, yeah, the Royal Rewards Card Magic. It's super cheap book. You can get a paperback for like ten bucks um, at your bookstore online. It's at fifty two cards if anyone wants to pick it up. But yeah, that has like a lot of the fundamentals of this craft. Um, sometimes 
techniques and different moves can be a little bit difficult to learn off of uh, words on the page just because they're a bit technical and you know they're visual in nature so online video is really helpful especially helpful when it comes to those so there's a lot of resources on youtube as well um but yeah if you're looking for a book that would be the good uh, starting place yeah that's a great one i got it from the library uh before years ago yeah but you're right uh it takes like a extreme focus to really sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to pick it apart and mm-hmm. figure out like what they're trying to tell you to do through, yeah. through in the this words. day and age and they have some illustrations which are helpful but yeah. usually it's just like a few illustrations mm-hmm. um but that's where a lot of us started and so it's nice to also get kind of the lineage and the history of you know the way that this craft has been um, taught and learned in the past and then you're you're in a better position to uh, learn from the more modern sources as well after mm-hmm. you've gone through yeah that. a little history and uh but I, I do love watching on um, a visual too, for sure. Yeah. Of course, it's, it's yeah, yeah. one of the best. Uh, and if you had to choose one word that you would focus on to improve on in your life, uh, whether it's your company or personal, uh, would anything come to mind? Um, the first one that comes to mind is uh, discipline. Like, it's hard to be discipline sometimes especially when you're self-employed and especially when you're working on your own company like it's easier if you have like a boss who's holding you accountable or whatever um but when you're accountable to yourself staying disciplined can be a, a challenge yeah yeah I, just like holding yourself accountable and making sure that you're doing the things that you need to do and you're being productive enough because it's easy to slack off when you have no one to answer to that's great i love it yeah I read this book called Discipline Equals Freedom. It's very good. Uh, I like that. Jocko I like that statement. Yeah. yeah, Discipline it is Freedom. Is, and the book's really cool because it's super easy to digest. Yeah. And it has pictures and you see like black and white pictures of sweat on the floor and he, he's just all about like, it's kind of not just about working out, but uh-huh. he, but he, that's his like the hub. Right, right, right. It's very cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me here. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure to chat with you, man. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, Please show your support by taking a few moments and leaving a positive review on iTunes or Stitcher. It would mean a lot to me. It's like giving me an electronic hug or kiss. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Unfake It Till You Make It podcast. For detailed sources and show notes for this episode, visit www.unfakeittillyoumakeit.com. Until next time, get up. Get going and get creative.